Welcome to Unit 6, Part 2. Um, we're now going to talk about threat potential. Analysis used to determine the level of access control, which includes demographics of location, type of industry, function of employer, physical security measures, evaluate access control methods, use combination of physical and access control measures. So this is just a little pictogram of all the different, uh, not all of them, but many of the different industries that we have. And, and I'm not sure what all of these pictures are, but for example, you know, the shopping cart is obviously retail. And we talked about this back in the introduction video, all the different places and companies and facilities that have private security. And they're all very, very different from each other. Retail security. Uh, the threat potential to a retail store is going to be very different than um, the threat potential at, say, a bank. Uh, this little pictogram here is um, chemicals. So chemicals makes me think of industry, industrial, what threats face industries. Um, you know, here we've got a train and a car and a plane. And so those are obviously transportation. There's different kinds of threats that they face that are not the same as the threats that retail and, and industrial sites face. Um, a little bed here that could be a hotel or a resort. Um, the little heart monitor here, we have hospitals and healthcare facilities. So these are all just to get you thinking about the different types of threats that each of these may face. A thorough assessment of potential risks and or hazards which could impact the security of the employees, assets, information, and physical facilities should be undertaken. This assessment is used to determine the level of access control necessary to adequately protect the facility. There are a number of factors to consider when determining the threat potential at any given area or location. And these include demographics of the area. So what are we talking about? Well, city versus rural city versus rural. There's good and bad to both. We're not putting a value in saying that city is better or worse than the country, but each have their own unique characteristics that absolutely play a part in how well we can provide security. So for example, a city is going to have a dense population, a lot of people. Um, and the country is going to have sparse population, not a lot of people. And again, I'm going to wait until we talk on, in a Zoom meeting. Um, I don't want to just give you the answers, but can you think about what is good and what is bad security wise? with city versus country, country versus city. And again, there's good and bad to both. So what, what are the risks and what are the benefits to being in the city? What are the risks and what are the benefits to being in the country from a security perspective? Um, think about that and see what answers you guys come up with. Um, history, you know, part of demographics includes uh, history of crime in the area. Then you have to look at, well, what kind of industry is it? Is it a government building? Is it retail? Is it manufacturing? Is it residential? Is it healthcare? So I just kind of talked about those. These are all very different from each other and they all have different threats that they face. Um, occupant function. What is the type of activity taking place? For example, the level of risk in controlling access to a research facility versus a retail center versus a warehouse may be different. What level of physical security is already in place? What kind of staffing is there? Do you need more officers? Do you need fewer officers? Are there alarm systems? 
Should there be alarm systems? Is there closed circuit television cameras? Maybe there is, maybe not enough of them. Maybe you need more. Um, is there perimeter fencing? Is that really needed? Um, what is the response time of local police? Meaning you call 911, how long typically on average does it take for them to get there? These are the questions when you do an assessment, a secure, by the way, people get paid a lot of money to do these assessments for businesses. Um, so that's like a whole other career you could go into. Um, the following access control methods should be evaluated when considering the level of access control. Physical placement of a security guard at a control point, installation of a gate or a door at a specific location, and if a higher level of security is required, a combination of physical security measures and access control would be indicated. I actually find this very interesting, um, in case you can't tell. Now, if you recall from the objectives in the very beginning of this unit, you need to know the definition of these three terms. So, sabotage. These are the three major threats to industry and government. Sabotage. It is the destruction from within by employees or visitors. So you purposely harm something on the company property, sabotage. Espionage is spying. And you can see SPI right in there, spy. Terrorism, that is the unlawful use of force and furtherance of political or social objectives. And you have domestic terrorism, and you have foreign terrorism, and we'll be talking about that uh, in a little more detail in a minute. So, all industries and organizations face threats to their security and stability. These threats can occur from internal as well as external sources. Security systems and staffing are designed to minimize the risks and address the exposures generally from overt threats such as crime, fire, theft, etc. So we have overt, we have covert. Overt is obvious, obvious. Covert is hidden or sneaky or secretive. Aside from overt threats, obvious threats, to security, organizations must address security exposures from covert sources. The security guard, when charged with controlling access to a facility, should be aware of the three major threats faced by industry and governmental facilities. Sabotage. Sabotage is defined as the use of treachery and subversive tactics to cause damage to or disable equipment and or property of a business or government agency. Sabotage can be caused internally by employees, vendors, visitors, etc. It can also be caused by external sources such as protesters, former employees, youths in the area, etc. The damage can be purposeful to make a point or it could be unintentional such as common vandalism. I mean, it's, it's intentional that you purposely broke something, um, but they mean unintentional like you didn't have some bigger motive. You were just being a jerk, you know, but you didn't like hate the company. And, and I mean, that could happen too. So I really like this picture. Um, you see that these um, gears, uh, there's a wrench stuck right in it, binding it all up, screwing it all. And I can, I don't know what kind of machine this would be, but I can tell you that that would do major, major damage to the machine. So somebody purposely put that wrench in there to screw this machine up. That is absolutely sabotage. 
purposely hurting equipment in the company, um, that is sabotage. Okay. Then we have the espionage, spying. And see, he's got his little camera. And he's taking pictures of stuff. He's spying. So espionage is the surveillance, infiltration, and spying of the activities of a business or government agency. Again, this can come from either internal or external sources and creates challenge to the effectiveness of the access control program. In many organizations, espionage is a common practice among competitors in an attempt to gain a competitive advantage. When the employer or client is involved in a highly competitive market, i.e., computer, software, research, etc., the risk of espionage is to um, the risk of espionage is increased, and so should the effort to control access. And you know, just to keep it current right now, um, as I record this video, um, we are desperately people all over the world, scientists all over the world are desperately trying to find a cure or a vaccine for the coronavirus. We don't have it yet. We have a lot of brilliant, brilliant minds working on it. We have a ton of money getting put into it. We have some of the finest research laboratories in the world. Um, they are all, I hate to say, you know, they're not all, yes, they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They want to save people. There's no question they want to save people. But you have to realize that whoever comes up with it first, they're the ones that are going to get all the attention, all the accolades, all the awards, because they're the ones. So, so these scientists and these laboratories, yes, they want to help people and they want to be, they want to find that vaccine and find that cure, but they also want to be the first because that's right. It is a competition. So just in that field alone, you can picture where, you know, somebody gets wind. I, I don't have names of top research facilities off the top of my head, but let's just say, um, Oh gosh, so many. There's so many coming to mind. But you know, just say somebody Harvard Medical. Somebody gets wind at Harvard Medical that somebody at uh, John John Hopkins University Hospital Research. They're close. They're super close. They're right there. Well, it's not a stretch in this field in this world with espionage for Harvard to send somebody over. Um, see what they can see, find out what they can find out. That's, that's the world we live in, unfortunately. And I'm not, I'm just using those two medical facilities as an example, I'm not accusing Harvard of cheating or anything like that. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then of course, terrorism. I know that this is a word you have heard many, many times in your life already. Um, so terrorism is the unlawful use of force against persons or property to intimidate or coerce a government, the civilian population or any segment thereof in the furtherance of a political or social objective. And of course, there's the Twin Towers after the second plane hit. Um, so generally, when the aforementioned topics are discussed, all are thought of on a global political scale. However, they may also be applied on a domestic level in varying degrees. Bomb threats are one of the most common forms of domestic low-level terrorism in that it creates a disruption in normal business operations. The need for effective con access control is of utmost importance in the prevention of these vulnerabilities faced by the employer or client. Access control is achieved in a variety of ways. Most commonly, control is maintained through three means, environmental, physical, and personnel. 
In many organizations, it takes a combination of one or more of these controls to be totally effective. So as I go on to the next slide, um, we're going to be talking about these three things quite a bit. But before we move on, I want to go back to this um, terrorism idea. And I just want to make sure that everybody's clear that a terrorist act and a terrorist threat does not always mean people die. They often do, which is why, you know, when you think about 9-11 and some of the other uh, terrorist attacks, I mean, there's been hundreds and thousands of people killed. Horrible. But the actual definition of terrorism is right here where it says disrupts normal business operations. It crea creates mass panic and fear. So my point is, and, and they're using the bomb threat as an example, um, you can be charged with a terrorist act even if nobody dies. That's really important. If you do something like call in a bomb threat and so the whole building is now panicked and the whole building has to evacuate and everybody um is you know nobody's working you've disrupted the workplace that's a terrorist act it may be low level but it still falls under the definition of terrorism so don't think that lots of people have to die in order for something to be called terrorism that is not the um the case okay So, types of access control, environmental, which includes, or just as an example, landscaping and lighting, that's like what's in the environment, physical security, which includes systems and building construct construction, and personnel, which is the security guard. So, let me make me a little smaller here. All right. Environmental access control. Environmental refers to barriers created to control the flow of pedestrian and vehicular traffic through the use of building construction, strategically placed landscaping, and lighting. And I just thought that this was a great picture to show this. Now, I don't know if this is a resort or a hotel or even just a private residence, but you clearly see that they have used these small walls and shrubbery landscaping to guide the flow of where people are walking you're not walking anywhere you want to go because you're not because you have these these environmental barriers guiding you so that is actually part of access control um and he, you know they're talking about lighting here's the lighting um i do like i said i just think this is a great example this picture um of showing how you can use those things to um, control access and where people go. Physical security. I'm just going to give you a hint and tell you physical means electronics. Because when you, let me just go back for a second. Um, you may think of these things as physical, right? A wall is physical. Lights are physical. Yeah, the, in this in this context, they're environmental. They're in the environment. But physical security, I just usually think to myself, electronics. What are we talking about? It involves systems and tangible means of controlling access. These include such things as electronic card readers, which is what you see here, um, tamper resistant locks, security doors, central station alarms, closed circuit television, etc. Additionally, strategic placement of fences serves to create an outer perimeter to control access to the facility. And thirdly, we have personnel, per, not personal, but personnel. That always means people, employees. 
um, personnel, security guards, posted at entry points and at vulnerable areas with standing post orders and employer client rules and regulations governing access and restrictions. Their central purpose is to identify those attempting to gain access and approve or deny access according to standing orders. A clear and thorough knowledge and understanding of employer or client expectations is critical to the effectiveness of a security guard serving as the access control tool. Summary. So you should at this point be able to identify the basic elements of access control and ident um, access control and identification to include visual recognition, written documentation, third party authorization, and security escort. Define threat potential. Identify the definitions of the following terms, espionage, sabotage, and terrorism. And identify three types of access control. And now you would take your quiz um, when you're doing this on your own. And that concludes Unit 6, Access Control of the 8-Hour Security Guard Curriculum.